So what we'll be talking about today is how Cadence fits into aerospace applications uh, in the context of digital twinning. Thanks to Common International for having the opportunity here to present at the forum at the US Pavilion. That is very, very cool. Um, having seen Al Morton and uh, uh, those uh, uh, American heroes uh, on here before, this is a very great opportunity. Thank you for that. Digital twinning in error and defense applications. Digital twinning is a white term. There's actually this digital twin of myself, this digital Frank, um, right next to me. You can see him, but it's all my data, all my health data, all my travel data on United Airlines. Um, it's uh, all my pack of uh, background data, which makes up my digital footprint, if you will. And digital twinning is a term used very widely in electronics as well when it comes to applying real life data so data from a real air uh, flight data from a real car ride to a simulation to a digital version of the design which you're running and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how Cadence fits into all this so if I look into a uh, jet plane. We had lots of cool ones here um, uh, yesterday already, and in about uh, 10 minutes, we'll probably have hear them overflying us as well. If you look at a jet plane like the F 35, it's a true what we refer to in the design world as systems of systems. So we have hardware and software in it, we have just for the cockpit, we have 8.3 million lines of code according to the data very complex interactions between the systems. The pilot has this, um, this VR headset where he can basically look down and he sees what he's flying over. So very, very complex interaction and you need multi-domain expertise. There. So you need to do the electrical, the mechanical, you need to um, put it all together. So if you decompose a system like this, you have products underneath, like in this case a communication system. Note this is conceptual, so I'm not um, uh, pretending that this is all like this in the, um, uh, in the actual F-35. This is just an example of how, for example, the communication system would be a subsystem communicating with all the other components in the plane. And in here, you bring your chips. You have um, custom silicon here with lots of software on it. In the F-35, I think we have over 200 uh, custom chips, actually, uh, as part of all the subsystems in the F-35. So how do you develop a system like this? And how is the, what, where's digital twinning coming in? I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, although the accent will give it away. I'm German originally. So if I wanted to design the San Francisco Bay Area up here, I would not start at the level of rooms and electricity. I would start with broad strokes. Oh, I need this place there at the bay, that's San Francisco, I have San Jose, and I have, need a couple of streets to connect them, so I have my Highway 101, 280, and all so forth. And then I define going down into the more details. And the same thing is happening with a system design top-down, like for uh, airplanes and for cars where I first look into the system ar architecture, the multi-domain aspects, I'm looking into the product architecture, the different pieces I have in the plane, and then I look into the subsystem and chip architecture, and underneath I have blocks, building blocks for the chips, both hardware and software. So I'm reusing existing blocks here in my system design. So where does Cadence fit into all this? Just to give you a, a brief um, uh, overview where Cadence fits. We are an enabling industry, EDA, the Electronic Design Automation Industry, is this design industry which was helping since the 60s to develop chips, right? So this is Moore's Law, everything's getting more complex every 18 months with doubling transistors and so forth. This has now developed today into very, very complex chips and um, system on chips, as we call them, SOCs, which have, at this point, are modeling AI, machine learning as part of the chip design, 
we as EDA, as a design industry, kind of like an architect for a house, we have the design tools for developing those chips, which at this point are running in parallel implementations. We have full flow solutions for things like safety uh, of chip design, and we're actually applying deep learning techniques to the design of the tools as well, so that the optimization of the chip design can use the, the, the designer's um, intelligence, if you will. We are learning what the designer is doing to optimize the tools. So EDA fits in with building blocks. So you have uh, building blocks like interfaces in a chip. Over there we are presenting our Tensilica core, which is a specialized core for visual processing, for example, and it can be customized for specific operations in the edge AI domain, in the vision domain. Then you have tools for chip implementation, so we'll help at the end to get you the layout. We help to make sure that all the components on the chip and the chip in the system um, are co uh, correctly interacting and um, especially that the software can be developed early on it. We do the board, we help with tools for board design where you take the different chips, integrate them, and then now you analyze how they work together. So you analyze, for example, here, what are the thermal effects in a, um, in a um, assembly like this where the whole system is put together. I'll talk about that a little bit in more detail later. That gets you to the system hardware, and hardware is only one portion of it. Now on top of it, you have a very complex software stack from drivers, operating systems, middleware, up to the actual applications that run on your design, which are basically um, a software mirror of the hardware stack from IP subsystems, chips into the board. You have drivers, operating systems, middleware, and actual applications, and they all interact quite heavily so we as Cadence, we focus on the hardware and the hardware software interaction here, enabling those designs and developments. So what's driving us as a Cadence? Um, there are several trends going on here in the semiconductor industry. Everything is going towards domain-specific compute. So people for AI, for example, they have these DSLs, the domain-specific languages and implementations. You have more and more system companies now building silicon. So if you look at um, in the past where this was a chip provider uh, providing silicon to a system house, system houses are now vertically integrating again, controlling the silicon themselves. You have lots of new silicon startups in the application, in the artificial intelligence and machine learning domain. You have a lot of, lot of activity, a lot of investment right now into silicon startups. And then industries like automotive, aerospace, med medical are going through a yeah, renaissance, if you will, of uh, electronification of those industries. So what used to be in the car, more, mostly mechanical, you have mechanical engineers and so forth building cars. The amount of electronification is growing significantly and the same is true for aerospace and medical as well. We as a company, just as a brief introduction, we are um, at about uh, 2 billion in revenue, 2.1, 2.3. We had um, uh, the Q1 in fiscal year was about 577 million in revenue. And this is interesting. We have a very large investment back into R&D as, um, as part of our overall revenue. Where Cadence is going as a company, this is kind of the existing base where we're going from. We have the chip implementation flow. We deal with RF design, analog design. We deal with verification. And we have, as I mentioned, um, IP building blocks um, for chip development. From here, we are growing up into embedded software. So we are partnering with companies like Greenhills for embedded software and security. And we're going into system analysis where you're putting the different components together and um, uh, analyze how your system performs. 
on a system on chip level and in the board and the product level as well. And from here, the next level up is really this um, machine learning AI portion where we have machine learning inside and outside that's in our tool. So we're using machine learning to optimize the implementation um, of, of designs and to basically optimize how our tools act. Um, outside means we are uh, enabling new flows with machine learning, how our tools, how our tools are operated. And then enablement means we have a lot of AI machine learning customers who use our tools. They are optimized for this domain with having the right capacity, having the right interfaces available to allow you to do machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence design. So how are systems now verified in the context of software? At our booth we have these uh, gummy bears with a slogan on it, emulate before you fabricate. So it's all about how can I bring together my hardware and software early enough, that's what we call shift left, how can I bring together hardware and software as early as possible in the design flow so that I remove defects as we're going on? So here's an automotive design chain example. You have a microcontroller which goes into an electronic control unit, into a subsystem that actually goes into the vehicle. And it's quite interesting to see how the dependency between the supplier and the user changes. So the OEM has actually much more of a software view these days, basically driving software top-down from the OEM's perspective, middleware part of the, as part of the subsystems, and then for the microcontroller unit provider from the MCU provider, you abstract this, you have these MCAL layers to allow, um, uh, to allow um, uh, software abstraction so that the system houses can um, provide software for those designs. So in the automotive diagram you have this, um, in the automotive world you have this V diagram where you have from requirements to system design, subsystem design, you get to the control unit and then you do the integration testing, testing, subsystem integration, system integration, and then the full validation of the system. The ECU development in here can take by itself uh, uh, 12, 15, 18 months and what we are doing in this term shift left in automotive, we are doing this integration early on, we are taking shortcuts here by providing virtual representations and those are in themselves digital twins already to allow the integration to happen before you actually have implemented everything. So from a airplane perspective, you don't have to go all the way down and fly it and then fix it and fly it again and fix it. It's essentially a virtual integration flow which allows you the shift left um, of the development and get to the design much faster. So here's an example. Here you have again your IP subsystem, system on chip, uh, as you see in the system and the software on top of it. Here you are removing your bugs in the design and then you come to this phase where for a chip design you can only make small changes and um, engineering change orders, go to production, go to post silicon. This by itself takes significant time, so about 60% in my project flow I basically have to have all the hardware software bugs already removed, so that's why that's what traditionally has been software development on the chip. We are enabling this virtualization much earlier on. How do we do this? Instead of waiting for the board to be there and this chip being integrated into the board, there are engines in the electronic design automation world, starting with abstract engines through more detailed descriptions, hardware assisted um, execution, that's what we call emulation, as well as prototyping which allows you to run tests and virtualize the system early on. And those in themselves are, if you will, digital twins from a verification perspective because they represent an early stage of what this, this system is going to be. If I have a defect here, I can go back and reproduce it here 
uh, in my early version of the hardware. So what do users care about? It would be nice if there's one engine that can do it all, but there are different care about users have. They want it as fast as possible, they want it accurate, they want it to run the full capacity of your design, they want it to be as affordable as possible, they want hardware and software design need to control the system, connect it to the system environment, bring it up as fast as possible, and there's really no one engine, no one verification tool that allows you to do all of this equally well. If you look into a selection of dynamic engines here, which you can use to represent your hardware to run software on, you can wait for the prototyping board. It's actually quite difficult to um, uh, debug hardware in comparison to the early engines here because you would have to have uh, put in hooks for debug in order for hardware to be efficiently be debugged. Hardware changes are hard, you have a system at this point, so you really want to find as many bugs as possible on earlier representations like virtual platforms. Virtual platforms are at the transaction level, they are representation at higher levels of abstraction on which the software can run like software development kits. That's what's often referred to in the software world as emulation, like an emulation of a flight simulation. And then you have hardware emulation. Hardware-based simulation, that's our supercomputer called Palladium, which is optimized to represent the chip implementation for verification and software development. And then when you need faster speed, you go on to an engine which is FPGA-based. Like our, um, like our Proteum system here. So the reality is, it would be nice to have just one engine that can do all of the um, execution, but and the reality is, <coughs> you need to connect these different engines together to build your system and to verify your system. How do you do this now? You basically have your emulation form, your prototyping form, virtualized representations of the chip and as you are doing your chip development you basically run these um, early representations, these early digital twins for verification purposes to, um, to reduce the bug rate, to reduce the bugs and find the defects, fix them and as you find issues here you can always hop back from the um, effect from the defect you find in implementation, you can hop back to a pre-silicon representation of your chip and can validate that what happens in the real world here on silicon actually was implemented as such and you can uh, remove the bug from here. So now, looking at an example, you have your chip, with the software in the product in the plane, you may have all kinds of electronic components like the body electronics, the information systems all interacting. The way you now connect them is and emulate them, you take different components, put them into the emulator. So here I'm taking my digital audio component into one emulator, my mobile communication into the next one. And then I have virtualized nodes for some of the components here, like the interfaces. And then I use uh, what we call speed bridges, which are rate adapters to connect the virtual world with the physical world to um, run the, this mixed level setup of chip implementation with um, virtual nodes of your system. Here's an example of a company in Silicon Valley, how they're doing this. This is NVIDIA's emulation lab, that's public information, where they basically run the chip in the box here, and they basically connect it before the chip is available into the graphics unit of the PC, and they validate that the graphics work together um, with, the, um, with the software running on the processor. Another example here is uh, Northrop Grumman. 
um, uh, where we are collaborating on chip design. This is a press release from earlier this year where we are partnering with North of Garmin to um, facilitate the in a design innovation, innovation at advanced nodes and that included, for example, the Palladium Z1 emulation here in that context. So when I, the item here I described, the emulator, this is the emulator that's based on the custom chip we have. We also have a prototyping platform which is based on um, uh, standard um, FPGAs which gives you scalability for performance and capacity. If a system runs in here, we can easily run it here as well. And you have multi-user capabilities here, so you can have several users accessing these systems. So now what about the other items? I had mentioned physics, uh, I had mentioned um, reliability, I had mentioned how uh, the multi-domain components have to work together. So what about system level integrity, physics, and reliability? Well, if you look now at your chip tool system, chip package board, and the full system, you want to look at electromagnetic, thermal, optical, mechanical effects and run them all together, ideally, in the context of safety, security, and quality concerns of the system. And that's where digital twins will fit in here in a moment. So you have um, for, uh, in our product portfolio, you have physical simulation for basically all of the levels of abstraction you need, from the silicon level where you can deal with transistor aging, to the package level, to the board level, to the ECU level, and even the network level where you can look at how the cabling uh, impacts uh, your uh, your overall system and the, how the connector performance implements uh, uh, impacts your overall performance. In this context, we're doing things like um, 3D solving. So this is a product recently announced, the Clarity 3D Solver, where you can basically look at the electrical fields into a system, and you can do the 3D analysis on this. This is very much used in automotive to basically model um, the electrical fields uh, early on. This is during the development phase, but of course, later on, when you have data from your real system, you can reapply them to those earlier um, simulations. This is our um, uh, Clarity 3D solver, really. Um, allowing 3D electromagnetic extraction simulation. It's distributed processing and it gives you performance and capacity while maintaining the accuracy of the system. Thermal is another big issue. I had mentioned that already, this um, notion of at the IC level, at the multi-physics level, at the ECU level, being able um, to have analysis early on how your thermal effects are um, depending on the electrical performance of the system. So you want to look at to find hotspots, you want to um, look at transient simulation where you have time varying power profiles for multiple operational modes your system runs and so you really need to now look together from the chip to the board the integration level. Uh, and thermal analysis. We have capabilities in that domain as well, which is the Celsius uh, thermal solver, where you can basically look at the system and do the thermal analysis um, well before your app system is uh, integrated. So where do these digital twins fit into all this? Going into the final stretch here of the presentation. You have data applied uh, to all your components, Internet of Things, all the um, edge nodes, all my tracking of my steps and my sleep. You have data from the storage, you, com you drive the data, you transmit the data, and you process the data. So from an, um, and that's where artificial intelligence fits in dealing with all the data around it. So if you look at uh, digital twin definitions, an aerospace domain, it's really meant to be 
a representation of the current state of a manufactured product at any given point in time. So if I download all the flight data from the Emirates flight I'm taking, uh, I took um, uh, day before yesterday to fly from San Francisco to here, I can apply those flight data back to a digital twin model to understand whether or not um, my different parts in the system, for example, uh, need, to, uh, need to get replaced pretty soon. There's also this notion of a digital threat, which is a record of all states of a product. So this is now like taking all the Emirates flight going day over day, and um, um, that's giving you a digital record of all those states. In the case of verification, which is what I had described, a digital twin is a representation of a product or system which is functionally correct, predictable, and reproducible as a representation of the product or system I'm developing. So that's this emulator where I take real-life data of a flight, apply it back to the chip as it resides in an emulator. So, data transfer is very important. You have your system simulation, you refine data forward all the way to silicon, and now you run the actual data sets and you apply them to earlier representation like a <coughs> virtual platform at the transaction level, like a emulator. So you can apply real life data from here to a digital twin to check for defects and you can front load the analysis. You can apply real life data to tune the performance, so make changes here in your design um, to tune performance. and. Um, in all practical means, you can do things like predicting maintenance issues. You can change software loads over time based um, on based on the actual run, so you can apply different software loads, and you can um, monitor the impact if it's a digital twin which represents the mechanical portions as well. You can monitor the impact of the mechanical wear basically taking all the data from the flights I mentioned earlier. I'm taking a design and loading the design into an emulator or into a prototype. I connect it to the real hardware. I run my software on top of it. And then I apply the actual flight data to it. So I take the actual system data and apply it to my digital twin, which in this case resides in the prototype or the emulator. And from here, I do performance and data analysis and analytics. I'm looking, I'm looking at functionality, I'm looking at performance, power, reliability, safety, all those issues, taking into account the real flight data, basically brought them back into a early representation of my chip and a, a digital twin representation of my chip and design. So machine learning and all this, with all this data going back and forth, plays a big role. We as Cadence deal with um, machine learning inside our tools to improve our engines, to automate the flows, and we enable with tools like the Tensilica Core, with our hardware software co-design tools like Palladium and Proteum for emulation and prototyping. We enable AI chips. And there's a lot of interesting new work going on here. So um, digital twins and artificial intelligence, you have to be careful that those twins are not becoming a bit mean because it's very hard to verify your uh, convolutional neural networks to verify that they're actually supposed to do what they're uh, doing. You need to ensure the proper number and type of uh, training sets Security safety are issues to be looked at in the context of digital twins. Who owns all the data? If I run all the flight data, is that um, something that goes back to which uh, ownership? And then how do I really run electrical, thermal, mechanical, all those items together in one simulation? So this is a um, set of challenges for verification which will keep me busy um, well into retirement, if you will.
Um, so it's an, a very interesting uh, set of challenges ahead for us. In summary, what are we doing as Cadence? We basically, with the intelligent system design solutions as we call them, we are enabling digital twins at all levels, at the SOC design level, verifying, implementing, we have the IP, we have services, we have in the system, the ECU design, hardness of wall design, virtual prototyping, dealing with signal integrity, power, thermal integrity, and then at the product level, system level, we look into modeling systems of systems, the networks, modeling the networks, dealing with things like signal integrity over the different connections, um, uh, co-designing the ECAD and MCAD, and uh, dealing with the simulation of physical channels. So, in short, we can simulate everything pre-production um, pre so that you can do the right choices, make the right choices during an implementation. All of this runs in the cloud, so we are working with partners like AWS, Azure, um, to um, provide all these items in the cloud. And um, we, at the end of the day, have this strategy of intelligent system design where this is a classic EDA with digital implementation, analog RF, verification IP, growing up into system analysis, embedded software development, and eventually uh, enabling machine learning and using machine learning and AI in our tools across these application domains from aero automotive, IoT, cloud, and mobile. So here in Dubai, this aero defense, that's one of the target application domains slicing through all this with analysis specifically for items like the vision processing in, um, in uh, aero defense applications. With that, that's what I wanted to talk about. We have about um, um, two, three minutes um, before we probably have to cut down, so I'm open to any type of questions. Thank you.